This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. And now, here's Jeff. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in uh, the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Let's go 3,000 miles west. This long Interstate 90 it ends right there in uh, the 206 in Seattle, where we find our Renaissance man. He is a great journalist, Democracy Watch News. Of course, you can also uh, uh, find him right here on the Jeff Santos Show on Fridays. And uh, he's a great musician on top of all of that, too. If you're in Seattle, you'll find him at a number of uh, great music venues. Mr. Canfield, how are you, sir? Well, I'm doing okay, Jeff. Uh I'm actually sitting here drinking a cup of tea from a cup from Boston, but it's one of those, so it made me think of you, but it's one of those things where, like, you know, my mom went to Boston, and all I got was this stupid coffee mug, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I can tell um, you, you can find more than just a coffee cup in Boston, but uh, we'll have to get you over. Yeah. Over our way. So, uh, it's been great weather, but we had some really nasty storms over the last couple of days. In fact, uh, we lost our power for a little while. It was kind of a freak windstorm, and then. I was down on the coast and encountered one of the worst storms I've ever seen where literally the gale force winds were knocking me down. And unfortunately, I saw, you know, some guys in wetsuits down there that decided they wanted to go body surfing. And I kept trying to tell them, like, you, you can't, you, you can't even probably get to the surf because the wind is so strong and it's so dangerous. But unfortunately, I watched them for a while and they did, they, we're having a really hard time, and then as we're leaving, I saw the medics show up. So apparently, that didn't turn out so well. I was definitely risking it just being there uh, on the shoreline because of the flying debris and all that. It was like a hurricane. Pacific storms up here in the north get pretty nasty sometimes, and that's one of the reasons why not a lot of people live right along the coast because it's just pretty terrible weather in the winter. In the summer, it might be nice, but not so much at this time of year. So that's what's been going on with me. And writing an article at Daily Coast, too, about, you know, the Trump legacy, of course. Although I'm, I have to admit, as a journalist, I'm really tired of writing about the guy. I'll be so glad when I don't have to spell T-R-U-M-P again for a while. Ugh. Yeah, believe me. It, again, we got a lot of work to do. Hopefully uh, he will be um, convicted in the Senate. We'll find out if Fitch McConnell has any any soul in his left at all. Um, and bring 16 other with him, uh, Republican senators, and uh, once and for all prevent this man from ever running again uh, for president and, and hopefully get him out of our hairs. And hopefully the Attorney General in New York State and the DA in Manhattan, Mr. Vance, uh, can, uh, can you know, uh, tie him up in knots in courts uh, and maybe even uh, indict him uh, and, um, you know, put him in jail where he belongs i think that uh that's just the beginning of this we have a lot of people including those in congress that have to go at this as well uh and we have a lot of people in, in powers uh police departments included and i guess a couple of the seattle police were actually um you know um or, i don't know that they've been arrested yet but they were part of the um uh, that's what you're uh, you're hearing as well right yeah, the Seattle Police Department actually announced that two of its officers had been identified as participating in Washington, D.C., and so they are being investigated, um, but somebody outed them, you know, because their their faces probably got, you know, photographed or something, and it, tur- yeah, it turns out two of them are Seattle police officers, which, you know, and my response to that was, uh, unfortunately, it's a sad state of affairs in, in Seattle, and a couple other cities, well, a lot of other cities, but uh, I was not surprised. I mean, I've known all along that a lot of the officers, I don't know how many, because, you know, as far as I know, nobody's taken an official poll or anything, but it just seemed to me that there was a a lot of support for Trump by law enforcement, and Trump has always tried to appeal to the cops and the whole law and order thing, although it's (laughs) very ironic. The irony is so thick right now, Jeff. Uh, the fact that, you know, you had all these people dissing and supposedly Antifa's, you know, trying to destroy the country and Black Lives Matter activists were terrorists and all this. And then all of a sudden, no, it turns out that it's actually the right wingers that you got to watch out for because they're the ones that were trying to, you know, 
stop the proceedings of Congress. So, and, and what's on my mind, Jeff, and I don't know what you've heard about this. I know Pelosi was talking about this, you know, earlier today, but uh, I'm really questioning. Uh, well, the question on my mind is what's going to happen to the Republican members of Congress who have been accused of supporting seditious behavior on the part right. of Trump supporters? I mean, no, that's, I think that's going to be a big, big charge. thing. I mean, with the minority yeah. leader and Mr. McCarthy, you know, still voting after after the attacks, you know, still voted, uh, you know, to, to, to say that the election was stolen, um, you know, when there is no proof. And, of course, Mr. Biden won by several million votes. Um, you know, this this is this is the 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 part of it that you have to wonder, where is the mindset of these people? You know, how uh, how brainwashed how um you know on the on the take are they from donald trump um and you know really should they be serving in a in the house of, of the people you know the public the we you know we are as taxpayers are paying their salaries you know to what destroy the government destroy democracy it's it's a uh, it's a tragedy. So this has to be examined. You know, we obviously you know everybody's innocent until proven guilty, but there there needs to be full investigations here. And and anybody who who voted for for uh, for this initiative uh, should be looked at uh, and and should be thoroughly investigated about why you were doing something that you know very well uh, that no vice president has ever taken uh and can uh change the votes of the american people you know that's what pence what they wanted pence to do and that's why they were trying to hang him when he decided that he was not going to do it um you know i mean th- these things have to be put into consideration and that goes for the what 12 or 13 senators uh that became i think three or six after it happened uh as well and you know look you know it's 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 one thing to dissent it's another thing to advocate and uh, egg on uh violent protesters hopefully uh things will begin to change uh obviously this country needs it you know and we need we need we need obviously um i think uh, our good friend Bernie Sanders. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to catch Colbert, Stephen Colbert's late show last night, but he was on. And uh, I think the fact that um, Sanders, which has a a major control, um, I shouldn't say control, but a, a, a major factor within the progressive community, and I think at the same time is respected by voters on the other side. I always have run into this, and I don't know how much you have either. Um, people who were Trump supporters, particularly in 16, told me that, you know, if Trump didn't win the nomination, that they would have voted for Bernie. And I think that if Biden is smart, he would he would put Bernie Sanders front and center. And Sanders is going to have a position in the Senate as a budget committee person. And the fact that he was on Colbert last night... Tells me that he'll have a position as a spokesperson, um, you know, for not only the Senate but for Biden. If Biden is smart, they should they should let him, you know, without being in the administration, you know, be a kind of a de facto domestic policy czar. And I think that would be yeah, wise. Uh, well, you've been saying, you know, for years, for the last four years at least or more, that Biden and, and other folks in the Democratic Party need to recognize the movement that Bernie Sanders represents because it is the future of the Democratic Party. And it's no doubt that he brought a lot of young people into the party. Yes, there was some ten- contentiousness going on. But at this point, I think people have decided in the Democratic Party to try to work together, to try to build some bridges and try to get through this really difficult period where We've been under this very divisive regime, and I've been thinking, you know, I just, I have a song called Big Talk, right? And one of the lines is, it just reminds me of what's happening with Trump supporters, is one of the lines is, you know, if you think like that, then you better go back to school. Because if you think like that, then you're going to be somebody's fool. And it means that demagogues like Trump can come along, and they can manipulate people um, sort of trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator and all their prejudices can actually manipulate people and brainwash them into supporting things that are completely a uh, detriment to their own self-interest. So that's what we, we've been seeing. And I did hear um, uh, some of the, the segment that you played earlier with Bernie and Stephen Colbert, and I think it's a perfect platform for him because Bernie is just kind of a regular kind of guy. He's kind of like a Michael Moore kind of guy. He doesn't try to look fancy or pretty. He's just trying to do the do the right thing. 
And that's a big change from someone who is a demagogue. And, you know, we've seen that all throughout history, even in, you know, ancient Greece and Rome, they had their demagogues come along. And a lot of times they were wealthy patrons who came along and then basically uh, put on a lot of big shows and actually literally bribed people to vote for them. The Bread and Circuses was all part of that show to try to get people to vote for them. So we've seen that over and over again throughout history, and it's happened again. And sometimes it happens in a democracy where I'm able to manipulate people. The big difference here is that Bernie Sanders is the kind of person who he would be willing, I think, to make political sacrifices in order to do what's right for the country, whereas the guy who's in the White House right now is the exact opposite. He doesn't really care about people's best interests. He cares about him, and that's it. I trust that Bernie will try to do what's best for the country, and I think it's a hopeful note that Biden, when he was introducing his cabinet, made a special point to, to reach out to the Bernie Kratz and say, hey, you know, he's my guy, too, and we're going to be working together. Now, whether we can hold him to that, that's a different story, um, because, yeah, in the past, Biden has definitely been surrounded by the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, and I just hope that they realize that that is uh, now passe, um, that, at, like you were saying earlier, at least 40% of the Democrats are progressive, and so you've got to, that's a, that's a huge proportion of the party. You really got to speak to those people. And these issues, wage and college education and COVID relief and all this stuff, they're very progressive issues that I think the, that the Democrats really, really need to pursue strongly. They need to be very committed to them. None of this wishy-washy, oh, yeah, we'll give tax breaks to the rich, and then someday, you know, we'll help out the poor and the working class. That's over. People are really suffering now. As, as Pelosi said back in 2008, the party's over. Okay, we can't go on like this. People need relief. We need to rebuild our, our manufacturing infrastructure. We need to rebuild our economy. We need to revamp and reform our health care system. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, and I'm just tired of the last four years of this divisiveness, which distracts everyone from getting anything done, and as a journalist, I have to report on things that really are, are not moving the country forward. I want to be able to report on something like an FDR sort of administration where people are serious about help the folks in the country that need our help right now. The, the wealthy folks, they're doing great. The Bill Gateses and the Jeff Bezoses, they're just rolling in the money now. Uh, I guess, uh, I think, uh, actually, it's probably uh, the owner of Tesla is, I think, now considered the richest man in, in the world. But, they, you know, but these people are doing fine even during a pandemic, even during an economic downturn. It's the people that are trying to survive and pay their rent and pay their medical bills and pay their electricity bills and just get by and have enough to buy food and get prescriptions. That's very simple daily life stuff for people. And all of this glamour about, you know, getting as rich as you can and be and being a multi-multi-billionaire where you'll never even have enough time to spend all that money in your lifetime, it's just out of control. We really need a new set of priorities in this country. And if I were running for office right now, I would be running on a set, a new set of values that has a lot more to do with taking care of the people and a That's lot right. less uh, taking care and kissing the, the butts of the rich and powerful in this country. Cause that's gone on far too long. People are tired of it. Oh yeah, I mean that's that's the people on the street, left and right. Uh, you know they 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 have had enough of uh, of status quo politics that basically rewards the rich and those who have been in government for thirty or forty years, and uh, everybody else gets screwed. And uh, they they are sick and tired of this. And it, there needs to be uh, that's why we're getting a lot of young people involved in uh, in running for office. That's why uh, the Bernie movement has happened. That's why the Trump movement happened. Uh, you know, people are, are sick and tired of. of status quo uh, because people have not delivered um you know whether we're talking about pelosi or we're talking about uh uh you know the republicans as a whole mcconnell and the rest of that crowd i mean they have been you know in the case of the republicans they've, they've basically uh you know put a stop sign to any progressive legislation and pelosi and and people before her have been unable to move the the agenda forward um so you know that's where we are in, including uh, clinton and obama so we need new directions and hopefully you know may take a lot longer if bernie than you know was president as opposed to the current situation but i think it's all there man uh and you know but i will say this 
this. I think we have a great opportunity uh, if the pressure is kept on uh, on Biden and on uh, the leadership in, in the House and the Senate. Um, we can we can uh, we can make some big gains because I think, as you said, um, the progressive movement is powerful. We may be a minority. Uh, but we do have uh, energy here to to make these uh, uh, things work. I want to ask you because to me it, it, it's going to be interesting. And uh, I was uh, I was hearing somebody the other day about about musicians and um, you know how they they really are uh, the salt of the earth and they really have an understanding of where the country is. We all you know, can go back to the 1960s and Buffalo Springfield and Marvin Gaye and, 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 uh, and so many other artists that spoke of, of the horrors of the late 1960s and the assassinations of King and X and Bobby Kennedy and, and President Kennedy and others. Um, in my opinion, in my opinion, there is a, um, a real need here uh, for artists, which, you know, under that title, uh, is important, and, and you you have been a big part of this in your work. Talk to me about this because I think it's important what you have done, and, but in, in your own way, you're doing it. And I hope more people do that. Uh, give me your thoughts on that, Mark. Well, before I really dedicated myself to journalism, I was actually known around the Northwest as a protest singer, and I would show up at a lot of uh, demonstrations and sing my protest songs. So I wrote a lot of original music, which is politically oriented, and I'm doing more and more of that now, and it just has to do with the fact that I think, as you know, as a journalist, you sort of have to stay topical, and so I started to think that way as a musician as well. And there are some people who, over the years, have been very... I mean, Ann Wilson came out with a song called The Revolution Is Now, you know, different kind of revolution than the right is calling for, but she made sure that she wanted to be in the middle of that message of change in the country. And so I think having your finger on the pulse, being connected to your own community, and for me, that start, I've traveled and lived in Europe and all sorts of things, but, you know, this is my city, and so I always am trying to be out in the community and either as a performer or as an activist or as a journalist. And so I see what's happening, and I feel like I need to, as an artist, reflect that. It's sort of the bardic tradition as well, is that you know, these traveling poets and musicians who would go around the country and talk to people about what's happening. And there have been a lot of things that um, are happening that I, I need to write about. Uh, last week, I sang you part of that song you know, about holding the line for democracy. I feel like if I can take what's happening... And the, and the refrain sort of in that uh, song is too, is it's time to love your brother and throw away the gun because you can't build bridges by scaring everyone. That's kind of like the whole message of that song. But it it happens when I'm I'm watching video on YouTube or something or listening to a broadcast like yours, and suddenly I just get to say, you know, there's a message that needs to be uh, out there. And if I'm the one to give it, then that's fine. So there's a tradition in my past of being very political with my music, and I think it's becoming more and more so now. The thing that I find, though, is that um, history changes so quickly these days that you know you might write a song one day, and then two days later there's a whole other issue going on. So it's hard because so I'm releasing Keeping Up With The Joneses, that single, and there's a delay when you want to release your music in order to get it distributed on all the major platforms and things it takes a little while it's a couple week uh delay so you kind of have to time everything ahead of time and and you can't always be completely topical but there's also a guy here named dave ross who's been a friend of mine for a while and he he uh works at cairo television or cairo radio actually he's a commentator newscaster there and he's always been sort of an amateur musician and does that thing where, you know, he'll read a headline or, or read an article or see a news report, and he will immediately just go into his little MIDI studio and come up with a song. And, you know, admittedly, he's not, you know, the greatest talent in the world, but it's very appreciative. You know, he would say that himself, but it's, we, I appreciate the fact that he was able to be so topical and um, turn on a dime, you know, write a song. And these days, 
with the software that's available and the fact that I can produce my music to get home, um, it's possible to do that, to just see something, write a song about it, and within a few days actually have it released. It's really crazy. You have to release it yourself for a while in order to get it out there quickly because, like I said, you're waiting for the distribution companies and stuff to pick up on it. But, you know, I mean, I'm going to keep doing it. It's it's It helps me, too. It's like a cathartic process for artists. If you're really frustrated about what you see in the world, then singing a song about it and letting your emotions out. And sometimes, you know, artists get angry on stage. Yeah. Uh, they really show their emotions. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, though. I mean, as long as it's not yeah. violent. I mean, you know, we nobody nobody wants what happened in Monterey. Nobody ha- wants what happened, uh, you know, in, in other places, uh, you know, or to have Morrison go off on a uh, on a tangent in, in Miami or whatever. But you know, um, look at look what, what Rudy Guthrie was was doing years ago. Yeah, uh, Arlo Guthrie uh, and, and others in that family, and uh, you know, look look what we have accomplished with so many uh, singers and Joan Baez and on and on and on. Uh, so th- there yeah. is there is a history here, and I think you're, you're caught on to it. Keep up uh, what you're doing, my friend. I know uh, you've got a lot of great journalism in your, uh, in your future as well, but uh, I know this is a passion that you should uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, make some, uh, some good money with, and I, I wish you the best on that, dude. Well, you know, it's... It, you know, I've done a lot with journalism. I, I've been published hundreds of times. You know, I've lost track a long time ago. I've been on hundreds of media programs and things, television, radio, whatever. So I feel like I've kind of taken my journalism out there into the world. And uh, now I really feel like it's time to do that with the music because there was a time when I was playing in bands in Seattle and we were getting airplay on KEXP and things were going well. But other things came up in my life. I was also involved in academia at one point, you know, and thinking about going into the sciences. So there was all this. I got that residency at the University of Washington as a composer for a year in the music yeah. department. No, I mean, you you, you are that. the Renaissance man for a reason, my friend. Unfortunately, uh, we're both running out of time here. But I, I, I think you should pursue it, dude. And, uh, I will, you know, yeah. uh, we, we are... Um, at a point now where we we need uh, voices uh, out there, as as we've talked about, um, you know, whether it's on talk radio or it's in the world of music or Hollywood uh, or the world of sports, uh, what LeBron James and, and the NFL players and the NBA players have done on, on the issue of uh, social justice and racial justice, um, you know, has been huge. And same thing with some of the uh, baseball players, too. So these are all pieces of the puzzle. And, um, you know, again, you've been able to, to pull to get together. Uh, hey, thank you, man. Uh, we'll talk to you uh, next week. Uh, enjoy your weekend and be safe out there. Yeah, everybody, check out my article on Daily Coast. It'll probably be published tomorrow. And check out my YouTube channel. And thanks to all the musicians in the past that have done such great music to inspire me to want to follow in their footsteps. People like John Lennon and you know, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan. Oh, my gosh. So we're all standing on the on the shoulders of giants. And thanks, Jeff. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Uh, definitely, indeed. Uh, and, of course, Hendrix is another guy from the 206. Um, you know, folks, uh, important to uh, to keep to keep on this and uh again we're going to start next week giving out the uh the white house phone number uh for you to uh, leave messages they have a a phone message there so uh we'll do that as well as the house and senate uh, which of course is 202 224 3121 uh you know be civil uh but be persistent uh to get what uh, you think is important and we all know from the progressive perspective uh what that is uh again keep on fighting but be peaceful about it. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, go Pack Go. I'd like to see Cleveland give Kansas City a run. And uh, I'm going to go for Brady over uh, Breeze. Uh, so that's how I look at it, folks. And maybe Baltimore over Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> have a great weekend. My name is Jeff Santos. I got to go. Bye. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. And now, here's Jeff. It is hour two of the Jeff Santo Show, and welcome to it, folks. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, today, we have uh, Mr. Harvey Kay, 
the great historian, uh, the great author of many, many books, including The Four Freedoms, uh, FDR, and uh, and many others. Of course, the, uh, the great professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay will be with us for the entire hour. As I said earlier, uh, folks, um, we are going to be playing some sound from Bernie Sanders. And uh, again, uh, just sort of a, a tease for next week, we're going to try to get David Day in on uh, for an hour. We haven't quite figured out the time, whether well, it'll be paired with his uh, colleague at uh, the American Prospect, uh, our good friend Harold Meyerson, but that's uh, the plan. Uh, again, with the idea that I think David uh, represents a lot of us on the progressive side uh, that want to see uh, as Sanders as much as possible a Sanders progressive agenda that the prospect has written about for years. Uh, but, you know, to be aware of the realities of this that our good, our good, good friend Robert Craig has talked about. And 60% of the Democratic Party, as we know it today, is either centrist or corporate, establishment-oriented, and about 40% is progressive. You can play with those numbers one way or the other, but the progressives are obviously not in power. Uh, so, therefore, we got to be strategic about how we do these things. And that's where we begin the conversation with our good friend Harvey K., who, uh, of course, I will give credit where credit is due. Uh, and I think this is going to be a, a critical component uh, Harvey, in, in terms of how we get not only the $1.9 trillion that Mr. Biden talked about in his rescue package yesterday through, but how we move forward. And I think that it has to be done, and I give you credit because you have been pushing for Bernie to remain in the Senate, and at the budget committee level, he can be the guy that does the budget reconciliation that doesn't have to go to use the the 10 senators to get to 60. Republicans, of course, are are there, um, and that would block it. And I've been saying that's why we need the two me's, and that's why we need uh, our friends uh, Collins and others to be ambassadors, and we can get Murkowski to, to, to basically get us over the top. And then eventually do, which is necessity, in my opinion, uh, over the next several months to end the filibuster as we know it. So we can always have that. There's limitations to budget reconciliation. But I think that's the key. And there are reports that our good friend David Dane was saying is that, and, and David Sirota was saying, that, you know, Biden reversing to his, his DNA in the 1990s, um, you know, saying that, oh, we're going to you know, try to make a deal here and a deal there. We're going to go right through the, uh, uh, you know, make a deal with McConnell, whatever. That's insane. But that's how he became a senator for 40 years. I hope and I think that Bernie is going to be the key here and his allies and, and, and saying Joe Biden, you know, yesterday is gone. And don't stop thinking about tomorrow. And I think that that is, of course, the Fleetwood Mac song. But um, I think that's where he needs to go. Your thoughts, my man? Well, as long as you gave me credit, I can just go home now, right? <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, bye. Okay, well, okay. I mean, you said a lot. Sorry, you didn't hang up on me, did you? No, 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 no. I would never do that to you, sir. Okay, <laughs> okay well... My original thing was to say that nothing's really happened this week, but, of course, two weeks in a row, it's jumping. I mean, it's hot. Now, last night, of course, we heard about the what he calls the American Rescue Plan, which I can tell you I'm trying to put into sort of 1930s New Deal terms. And I think somebody asked me, if you gave from 1 to 10, what would you give the American Rescue Plan speech? And I said, I'd give it a 7. It's very promising. And here's the thing, however. I mean, we really do need to get that. You can hear me, right, Jeff? Yeah, I'm right not, ahead. I can I hear you clearly. Through. And so okay. can my great production director. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So the main thing, so the main thing is is that we, we know that we've got to get everything he's asked for in this first, as Bernie says, very strong first installment. And I'm the quoting Bernie Sanders. Very strong first installment. And please notice, the most important word in that is first installment. Yes. Amen. Okay? So in FDR's New Deal years, there were, people often talk about three R's, but there really were four R's. One was relief, and that is what we've seen in this American Rescue Plan. In fact, Bernie himself, in his press release last night, referred to it as a bold emergency relief plan, okay? He used the word relief. That's important. 
However, and I'll come back to this plan in a moment, what we still have to look for is reconstruction, recovery, or I should say recovery, reconstruction, and the key word for this, too, is reform, okay? Uh, notice that I didn't say the word revolution. I'm not, I'm not going to fantasize. I'm saying reconstruction and recovery and reform. Now, you, you cited the David Sirota piece. And, in fact, the David Sirota piece was very disconcerting because in one yes. day we get David Sirota's warning at the same time we get this plan. And here's, let me first indicate my fear, and then I'm going to talk about my hopes. My first fear is, is that this is the plan that then he thinks empowers him later to say, well, we really now have to control how much we spend. That he's going to become the you know, austerity guy all exactly. of a sudden, as Concerned, he was yes. for many, many years. Okay? Now, in, if that's the case, then you bet we have got to keep the pressure up. And Bernie, by the way, is now once again in a very... Thank you for acknowledging my, my reason <laughs> for... Uh, in there. Now Bernie is the spokesperson, possibly, for the movement again. Who would have thought a budget, a budget chair would be the movement voice? Well, he's already indicated this is the first installment. The question is how we go forward to recovery, reconstruction, and reform, all of which, except for reform, will cost a lot of money. Reform doesn't cost money. It costs political capital. Now, the next thing I wanted to say, unless you want to get back to the minimum wage question later. Well, I, what I want to do is I want to introduce the hope here, because, you know, there's a lot of dismay, as we uh, both talked about, uh, you know, off air and concerned uh, through our texting that Harvey and I do throughout yeah. the week, um, you know, about what Sirota wrote and, and the so forth. But here's Bernie last night, uh, Ron Kreider, on uh, Stephen Colbert's show. And um, this runs about five minutes. We'll, we'll cut it off probably after about a minute 30. Uh, but let's start off. This is Stephen Colbert talking to his good friend, Senator Bernie Sanders. Well, I think what has upset me the most is not just Donald Trump. Trump is a pathological liar and a demagogue, and I got that. But what upsets me the most is that some 73 million Americans supported him and that he did better in many depressed areas of the country than he did in 2016. Now, how did that happen? Why do people continue to support somebody who is a liar, who gives their benefits, makes policy to benefit the rich and the powerful at the expense of working people? How does that happen? How do we restore faith in government so that people understand that the United States government is going to be working for them. How do we bring uh, a, 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 a nation together, which Trump has done his best to divide us with his racism and his xenophobia? So we have an enormous task in front of us uh, in, in that regard. I think, you know, if you're asking me what's positive about all of this, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you have had uh, governmental officials, secretaries of state in Georgia, Arizona, other Republican states who, against an onslaught uh, of viciousness and threats from Trump's base, have defended the Constitution. And that's no small thing. Uh, but getting back to your point about reinvigorating democracy and voting rights uh, at the very highest level of priorities has got to be the effort uh, to figure out how we can create a vibrant democracy where if you disagree with me, that's fine. You're not my enemy. Uh, where we have free and fair elections, where big money does not buy elections, where we end the kind of racism and uh, xenophobia that we're seeing right now. Um, when there was some speculation that you would be Secretary of Labor, um, but when Biden uh, nominated instead Marty Walsh, he did say this about you. He couldn't think of a more passionate and devoted ally to working people in this country than you. Does it ever surprise you that the, the people who supported the president, those 74 million people, many of whom are working class white people in the United States, that you can't find common cause with them? Because many of the policies that you put forth 
would be beneficial for every working class person in the United States. Many of them for all people, but certainly speaking up for the people who do not have the, the power of the corporate money behind them is something that you're known for. What's your message to them? My message is let us work together on health care. Let's work together to make sure all of our kids, regardless of income, can get a higher education. Let us not allow the demagogues out there to try to divide us up, whether you're black, you're white, whether you're Latino, you want your kids to have a decent education. You want to drink water that is clean. You understand you need health care, that you can't make it on starvation wages. And what our job has got to be is to bring people together around an agenda that is, in fact, supported by the vast majority of the American people and vigorously oppose those people who want to divide us up by the color of our skin or our religion or, or where, where we were born. In, in 2016, Paul Ryan said Republicans should be scared of Democrats controlling the Senate because Bernie Sanders would be the budget chair. Before we go, what's the one thing that you could say that would scare Paul Ryan the most? Well, I would say to Paul Ryan is that we are going to start an effort uh, to tax the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations who today uh, are not paying by any stretch of the imagination, their fair share of taxes. Senator Bernie Sanders, everybody. That, we'll be right uh, back. Of course, with Stephen Colbert uh, on the uh, on his late show last night with Bernie Sanders, and we're uh, having some difficulties with Harvey K's line. Harvey, can you hear me? He cannot. Um, okay, Ron Kreider, if there's a way to get um, uh, the uh, issue taken care of uh, and get Harvey K back up with us, that would be uh, that would be wonderful. Um, I want to. I want to just sort of review what we just heard, and I, I think this is um, this is an important piece of, of the puzzle. Um, my feeling here is that if we can pull together, um, you know, the sort of enthusiasm and energy that seventy-eight-year-old Bernie Sanders has in that interview, and we can bring that to other members of Congress. And uh, both in the House and in the Senate. If we can do that, then we have a great opportunity, folks, you know, to, 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 to have the Bernie Sanders kind of agenda. Because he is driving and will be driving from his key post as the budget chairman in the Senate. And because the way the Senate is, when you have to, you know, pull things together, that to me is an, is an example that he and he alone can kind of really push. So that is where it's, that's what's at, at stake. Uh, Harvey, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't know. I just got dropped, and now I'm back. Okay, great. I don't know how much uh, of the Sanders uh, that you had a chance to listen to, but I one I of the... Before we came on. Okay. Well, one of the things that... Um, I think that is important, and again, we apologize uh, for the technical uh, uh, problems. Um, one of the things that I felt that was really interesting uh, to hear was the, the, the Paul Ryan, uh, you know, qu quote um, about him as the budget chairman, kind of uh, foreshadowing what's going to hopefully happen. Oh, yeah. But again, the budget reconciliation piece that it, we didn't have the sound for in that bite, but uh, and hopefully we can try to find that. Um, but to me, you know, he's saying this is how we can do it, and we're going to use budget reconciliation, which goes against the plan, the immediate plan of, of the Biden administration, or to be uh, future tense Biden administration, you know, by going through the current status quo, you know, deal with try to get filibusters or make a deal with McConnell to give him the goodies and reduce the, the help to the American people. I think that's where the pressure has to go from the progressive movement is to say, Joe Biden, if you don't listen to Bernie Sanders, you're going to end up being a not only a one-term president, but you're going to be a disgrace because you had the opportunity to do this and you failed and you reverted back to the Joe Biden that gets 10% of the loaf as opposed to 80% of it. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, I don't know how much of the interview uh, uh, with Colbert you played, but it's that piece, and then the towards the end, and I don't mean to 
jump ahead if you were going to play that, where Bernie pretty much assured everyone that the, that big business or capital, the rich, they're going to be taxed. I mean, he, he was very yeah, we clear. We did play that song, yeah. You did, good, because that to me was, that's the part when I heard it, I said, good. Because now if it's the case, the early part and the later part, it indicates that if Bernie doesn't have Joe Biden's ear, is going to then Joe Biden is is definitely definitely failing himself, not merely Bernie, because Bernie understands the imperative of acting for two reasons. First of all, because American working people need it, absolutely need it. It's not we we cannot afford a, a, another Carter presidency, another Clinton presidency, another Obama presidency. It's like now is the time, or we might as well just give up now and say, come on and take over the House and Senate. To hell with it. So, but Bernie gets it, and I think, in some ways, now his age matters probably because this is the chance—not for himself, but this is the chance that he can make a historic difference. And the trick now is to challenge Biden by supporting Bernie. That's and and well others said. in the House say, in, you know, because the House has a great deal to say about about budgetary spending. And it's, I've been saying this for a long time. To go to war with Biden, as some people want to want to want to do it, I don't. I just don't see that. But I basically, if you've got if you've got people in Washington, pro, real progressives. I mean, Biden's not a progressive. Real progressives like Bernie, like the Squad, and there are others in there. They must be empowered with our support. And and there's no other way to look at it because seriously speaking, 2022 is not very far away. No, you know, and yesterday our great economist uh, Rob Scott of the Economic Policy Institute said the same thing. You know, it, it basically is that if you don't move, uh, you know, to use our terms that you and I use a lot, an FDR agenda, uh, if you don't mm-hmm. go big and bold, you know, you go home, and I, ca- I say with the tail between your legs, uh, and that's where the Democrats, that where Joe Biden will go if he decides to play, you know, the 1990s game. And and that's that's a failure and that's the, maybe the end of the Democratic Party as we know it. Look, we just talked to David Paleologos, the great pollster from Suffolk University in Boston. And, and, and the numbers that he's going to announce to us on Tuesday, he's combined, is that the negative feeling in the country right now, on both sides, the, 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 the yeah. mistrust of media, the mistrust of government, um, as low as Trump's numbers are, Pelosi's are worst. You know, I mean, it is... It is to a point where we need good government and we need people to take the bold steps. The, the more bold he goes, the more people will say, hey, this guy actually is, you know, is Bernie Light. He actually is doing what we need to do. <laughs> if he says, yeah. if he does the stuff that everybody expects that's going to come out of just the same old, same old, and you know, people will shut him down. I mean, nobody's going to come out. Look. Joe Biden doesn't have half the set of skills that that Obama and Clinton had. And both of them right. got creamed in 94 and 2010. You trying to tell me Biden right. is going to talk his way out of well I just had I only could give you a few because we had to we had to watch the deficit and we had to do this and that. He'll get shellacked. Yeah, and I want to say something which is part of this whole equa- political equation, not necessarily legislative equation. And the political equation is this. We cannot operate on the assumption that the however many folks who tried to occupy the Capitol building and ended up killing six people, is it, it now the number six, at least five people? The two police okay. officers now are dead, yes. Yes, yeah, so we cannot assume that those folks are necessarily the best of the Republicans, okay? What we <laughs> yes. have to assume what we have to assume is that most Republicans, however misguided they may seem, are not those people who right. stormed the Capitol building. And in fact, if we're going to try to be store a confidence in the United States, a trust in institutions that deserve trust, look Fox News does not deserve anybody's trust. I'm not even sure MSNBC deserves anybody tr- anybody's trust. Or CNN, so if we're exactly, going to re- yes. But if we're going to restore trust, we're going to have to figure out how to, and how to bring the folks who are Republicans and are seriously concerned about their futures and their kids' futures. They're not, they're not, they're not drowning in the lies of the Trump years. The only way to do that is to engage them in 
look, Biden calls it Build Back Better. I'd say in the nation-building project that presents itself right now that Bernie is prepared to advance by way of the Budget Committee, and presumably others alongside of him will take up in other kinds of committees. And then, of course, the question is, will the House come through? I mean, we, we know the House leadership is, is, is an embarrassment but it's also the case that the House will generally go where the president wants to go. That's the way it'll work. Exactly. No, I think you're exactly right. All right, let's uh, go to the phones here. I want to bring in our good friend Stephen uh, from Lafayette, California. You're next with Harvey K. What say you, Stephen? Okay, uh, I'm going to make a couple points if I hopefully I can get them out. So let me just jump on before I forget. Um, Mr. Harvey just said about reform. When I first saw the rioters uh, at the uh, Congress, for 10 seconds there was one crazy person that was correct. He was yelling, saying that we pay taxes, we pay their salaries, and they don't do anything for us. With that said, they are forgotten. And in order to change them, as you said earlier, Joe, I mean, Jeff, Bernie Sanders spoke to those people. You have to That's meet right. their needs. They are, they are lost. They are um, number two. There's a, we also have a mental health problem in this society with veterans, police officers, and just crazy people that need help. We should have once a month, mandatory or every two months, mental health checkup and meet with your therapist because we need to help those people, okay? Number three, um, John or somebody spoke about media. We had, oh, I'll make it quick, we had Don Lemon yesterday talking how Trump was horrible, blah, blah, blah. It was his, it was his station that gave Trump free airtime. Number four, we need to get behind, also on the outside, inside strategy, as you talked about, Jeff, Reverend Barber. When he talks, people listen. We need to get one central message, all these groups behind him. And lastly, closing your eyes, you listen to Bernie, he's talking from the heart. I You're right on. I'm going to I'm going to hold you there, Stephen, because we're running out of time in this segment. We're going to hold you to the next segment. Again, folks, we'll, we'll be with Harvey K to the, to the top of the hour. You are tuned into the Jeff Santos Show. We'll be right back after this timeout.